ladies and gentlemen, in, in the interest of keeping the show on the road and trying to get back on track time-wise, uh, please make welcome our panel from your left, Bevan Paul from uh, Parramatta Leagues Club, Connie Sakaris from NAB, John Vassello from Celestino, and our moderator is Danny Rezek, who's the managing partner for the Deloitte Parramatta office. Please make them welcome. Well, good afternoon and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to get things started, but I'm also keen to uh, generate questions from the audience. So if just uh, we're going to go super high tech here. Just put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you and, uh, and then we'll fire away the questions. So um, I'm going to pitch this question uh, first to Bevan answer, but I'm happy to hear from, from the other panellists as well. We, we saw uh, earlier a, a list of... Uh, industries that uh, are growing in Western Sydney and one of them was tourism and uh, I know that you've got quite a number of investments that are taking place in your particular business but you might also want to share some of the other investments that are happening in, in other parts of Western Sydney, particularly these clubs and, and I guess what, what are those, um, what is the driver for that significant investment from your perspective? Um, there, was a, uh, there was an article in the Sydney Morning Herald uh, uh, six or seven weeks ago. I don't think it was meant to be complimentary, but it talked about the billions of dollars the clubs are spending on their developments. Um, um, I, I took it as a, wow, how good's that? Um, the, gov the infrastructure that the government doesn't have to build and, and facilities that are actually owned by members and not by, um, not by international companies or by shareholders. So all the dividends actually go back to the members of, of the clubs. But um, to your point, Danny, we've... Um, and note to Parramatta Leagues Club is just a little club a few blocks from here. There's a lot of macro issues being discussed here today, so we're just a micro example. But um, we're just uh, finishing um, $30 million worth of development with uh, um, our own brewery, um, our own 10-pin bowling centre, um, some new restaurants, a great big car park. Um, and... Uh, over the next few years, we are planning to build a 200-room hotel, which will be, for those people who are familiar with the area, uh, between the Leagues Club and the stadium. Uh, and the top half of the hotel will be able to see the game for nothing. But um, we'll be spending <laughs> about... Um, although it'll be reflected in their room rate. Uh, we'll be spending about $200 million over the next uh, three or four years. And... Uh, and as you pointed out, Danny, some of the uh, we're not the only club that's investing in those kind of facilities. And you know, we, so we saw tourism is, is is one of those growth areas, and clearly uh, we, we talk about tourism is generally viewed as attracting, I guess, um, international type guests, and the the airport's going to do that. But so often tourism is really about attracting uh, our own residents, isn't it, to come and participate in mm. activities, and whether it's coming to the Lees Club or, or going to the Blue Mountains and going on a bushwalk or whatever else it might be. So the, there's, a, there's been an app that's been put out, Sydney's West. Um, are you seeing a discernible difference off the back of that application which really articulates, I guess, all the different activities into one spot as what's happening across all of Western Sydney? Um, we're still a bit of, of a construction site at the moment, so if you're going to visit, come in about three months. Uh, <laughs> we'll be pretty flash by then. Um, uh, look, to be... Forgive me for descending into technical jargon, but the, the thing about building big assets, uh, like the stadium, for example, is that you have to build stuff around them, otherwise they're no fun. Um, so I think that's that's probably the best way to answer your question, Danny, is that we, we're trying to build a, a series of, of things that make it a day out for people. Mm. Um, if you don't build those kind of things, then it's, it's like... And ANZ Stadium, when we talk about what the club's doing, um, for people who go there, everybody gets there five minutes before the kick-off and goes five minutes before the end because there's nothing else there. And um, But with the developments that the lease club's undertaking adjacent to the stadium... Uh, it will be a day out for thousands of people and it will be a lot more fun. Thank you. So we heard from Peter just before about the, the jobs deficit and also the, the, the comment around the, the, the demand versus supply. Now, NAB, in fact, is making a significant investment in its own right by obviously uh, participating in Parramatta City Square. And, and I guess there's two parts to this question. One, what, what prompted that decision to invest there and then secondly um, 
how else are you going to activate, I guess, your your presence and investment uh, in, into the region through small business, perhaps? Thank you. So, so yes, so there was a lot of... Um, sorry, if everybody can hear me, I'll just come in a bit. There was a lot of... Um, research done around, uh, you know, where would our Sydney flag shop, uh, flagship hub be? And uh, currently we're in about, I think, 15 buildings through Sydney and we want to, other than our business banking centres, we want to really reduce that to two. And, and the flagship, uh, we decided on being in Parramatta, at Parramatta Square. And there was uh, three, I think, three key things around that. One was we talked about where do people want to live? Uh, and work and how does that work for our staff. So that was the, the first piece. And some of that feedback um, surprised us around where people preferred to live and work. And so that was a, a key determinant. And then the, the second one was who we are. So we're Australia's largest business bank and we have a very large footprint, footprint in health. And so when we, th and we also, um, you know, for us, we are the infrastructure bank uh, in Australia. And so for us, when we think about you know, how we talk to community, how we talk to government around what needs to happen in, in Greater Sydney for us to maintain the livability that we want to see and that our communities expect to see. Um, Western Sydney plays a really important part in that. So how do we help drive? And, you know, tourism is really important about not just where you work, but where you live and how you live. And so when we think about, you know, the 30-minute cities and we think about the three cities, um, investing in, in, in Parramatta and the, and the greater part of that and really driving a couple of things, really being able to help business and help small business, which is really our DNA, um, and also in health, that's our DNA as well. So we understand, you know, how important the health precinct will be around here. And then the other piece that sort of ties into all that is is really jobs and the type of jobs because for for the vision of, of Greater Sydney to apply, you know, by you know, infrastructure New South Wales talk about 2056, Greater Commissioner Sydney talks around the same time. Um, we don't just need more jobs, we actually need different jobs and we need a variety of, of, of skills and a variety of jobs to attract people to remain in the area of where they live and where they work because we know quality of life is not to drive or not to be on transport for an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half in the in the evening. So all those things were things that we thought about when we chose um, Parramatta as being, you know, well, Parramatta being where our flagship hub is. Um, and then the other things that we're doing and that's really important is we're obviously very involved in, um, in Western Sydney and the leadership dialogue. We are right next door uh, to the University of Western Sydney and education is, is really key. So we're doing a lot with um, the university about thinking about when we enter that building uh, late next year, how do we work together? What does you know, innovation look like when you have university and a large um, uh, employer who is also transforming themselves due to uh, disruption and, and different things? And then how do we help business? And you know, so. Uh, in Melbourne, for example, in our flagship building there, we have um, sp we have community space where small business and, and startups can go and and you know and have an office there if they like. So there are all the things that we're contemplating about what our commercial fit footprint would look like um, in that building. John, your organisation is making at least two significant investments into the region that I'm aware of. Um, what? What's the thinking behind that? And I guess more to the point, you're not only creating jobs now, but you've also got a real uh, mind's eye as to what sort of jobs you'd like to create in the future. Could you tell us a little bit about the thinking and the motivation and, and what you're really pushing for? Uh, yes, thanks, Danny. Uh, so um, for those, those of you that don't know, um, uh, my company, Celestino, is uh, developing a... Uh, a uh, new community in Western Sydney called Sydney Science Park and we're just on the verge of uh, commencing construction there but it's really been uh, eight years in the making and uh, I guess a lot of the things that Peter talked about uh, in his speech which I, I think was fantastic uh, really rang true for us uh, in our thinking towards Science Park. When we bought it, it was earmarked for future industry and it's a quite a large property. If you think of it in terms of the where we sit here now, it goes all the way from where we are here to past uh, Camellia, almost a home bush. Or if you're in, uh, you know, Sydney, it goes from Circular Key to past the SCG. So you've got to put it in that context. It's a big part of Sydney. And there's somebody in the off 
you know, in the audience there who's got another big part uh, a bit further south, bigger than ours. But when you're planning Western Sydney, you're, you're talking big scale. You're building the Sydney of, of tomorrow. And so when we purchased it, it was it was um, uh, earmarked for future industry. And when we when we spoke to planning, their their ideas for it were, you know, uh, manufacturing and warehousing, which to me didn't make sense. I mean, coming from uh, Northwest Sydney and seeing the success of Norwest, and uh, and, and more recently uh, Rouse Hill Town Centre, uh, you know, you could see that the types of jobs were changing and and following you know economies as I do. Uh, you know, you could see that the, the new jobs and the new industries were being generated in areas that didn't exist, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and they certainly weren't based around, uh, you know, manufacturing and warehousing, as we've seen the percentage of jobs coming down in those areas. So for us, if, we're gonna be, if we were going to be developing a development that would take, you know, 20, 30 years to develop out, we really didn't see a future for us or for the area in focusing on, on, on manufacturing and warehousing. So, you know, we, we, our, my belief was based around what I knew of Norwest and, and, and that area uh, and places like Macquarie Park. But um, it was also based on the fact that companies like Google, Airbnb, you know, the five biggest companies in America and <coughs> by default in the world didn't exist 20 years ago at all. And, uh, you know, what, what made these companies come about and how could we be part of something that created companies and industries of tomorrow, we don't know exactly what they are yet, but what 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 could create innovation? What could create new industries? And I think Gary White also puts out a statistic: is the state planner uh, that you know, 60% of the jobs in New South Wales are being created by businesses that didn't exist five years ago, uh, and 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 any businesses that have been long around for longer than uh, 10 years, I think, have lost 10% of their jobs. So it's it's it, it, it's, it's a no-brainer that the, the, the best jobs, the new jobs, the new industries are being created by areas of innovation. So the thinking around Sydney Science Park was to create what we could do to help generate new ideas, uh, new innovation, and, and through that, you know, education's a massive part of it. And so, you know, very early on, we, we, we partnered with uh, Catholic Education Diocese of Parramatta to build their vision for how a new age school would look and, and feel. And, uh, and that would be based around our vision for a school that focused on science. And these days they call it STEM, and then people don't like STEM, they call it STEAM. And, <laughs> but what, what, what we've learned, and we've, we've, we've got advisors from you know, um, uh, America on this, and we've got, been over there and looked at their STEM schools, is it's, to, to a certain extent it's got not, not so much to do with what is being taught, it's, it's how it's, it's how it's being taught, and it's it's about teaching kids how to solve problems and to work as teams. And if you're if you're there as an employer, you want kids who are problem solvers, who are team workers. You know, you think about that. You, you, you're you're creating really good employees, really good business leaders uh, of the future. So the idea was, you know, we, we need to start from scratch, if you like, or you know, from very from the ground up. And so we focused around education. Uh, and we focused around um, uh, creating uh, education that itself generates a lot of uh, research and interaction with other businesses and, and universities. So we've really focused on clustering you know, education, research, industry uh, in the one place. But to do that in the middle of Western Sydney in, in Ludnam, uh, where there's not much amenity at the moment, and I learned from Norwest, is you need amenity. You know, people aren't just going to go and move in the middle of a paddock uh, and, uh, and, and you know, choose that over living in Surrey Hills or, or being located in somewhere like Parramatta or mm. closer to the city. So it needs to be part of one package. You need to, you know, if someone's, in, in this day and age, to attract a good employee, you need somewhere where there's great places to live, great places to go to lunch, got great places for your kids to go to school. You need the whole package. You need to create a community and that's why Traditional business parks aren't being as successful now because they're starting to lose talent to places in the inner city because young talent, you know, entrepreneurs are choosing kind of warehouses on the edges of cities because they've got all the amenity, even though they weren't designed for business, they're, they're attracting the, the talent. So if you like, we're kind of social engineering uh, mm -hmm. to, to create those, uh, the, to get kids and industry in there. And to do that, we really need amenity. And, and I guess to my point, 
you know, a really important part of that amenity will be uh, things that the state government is doing now, which is really building transport links, you know, the north-south train line, that's why we've advocated for that, you know, so, so strongly, because you need connectivity. You need connectivity between Western Sydney and you need connectivity from Western Sydney to the rest of Sydney. And the more connected it can be, the better mm -hmm. education opportunities, the more it, it'll grow and, 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 the, and the quicker it'll grow and the better the jobs that'll be created out of it will be. Thank you. Just to the panel, so we, we, we know tourism is, is a, a significant growth area, professional services, banking and finance are growth areas for Western Sydney. What are the other industries that you're seeing that are, are slated for significant growth? And then part B of that question is, um, are we doing enough to turbocharge that growth? And, and if not, what should we be doing? And I'll throw that open to the entire panel. I'll start. Uh, yes. I think, so for me, the other really two important industries are health and education. Um, and I think, um, you know, we've seen Western Sydney, University of Western Sydney has a great plan around their buildings and where they'll be and what they will be doing and how they do that. Uh, but I think it's how does private enterprise help partner with education because you want um, talent to be attracted here, you want people to study here, but then you want them to stay here and work. So being working together with private enterprise to determine the jobs of the future will be really key. And then health, I think, you know, Western Sydney and has a fantastic footprint at the moment, which you can keep uh, you can keep building on, and I think that will happen with further education and further private enterprise. I think the key, though, is is that that do what we talk about is diversity of jobs, and I and I it, and we need to do more on that. Mm -hmm. I think if we're really going to create um, the type of uh, Greater Sydney where we have you know, um, a myriad of different types of jobs and we, we have innovation both happening in Surrey Hills as well as um, in Greater Western Sydney, then we really need to apply, as, as strongly as we've been applying our minds to, you know, how do we connect both from a roads and a transport perspective and what do we need? We need to do the same things about the type of jobs that we, that we attract here and the fact that there will be different jobs that don't exist that mm. don't exist at the moment, that will exist in, in 10 or 15 years' time that we need to start thinking about. Um, and I think really how government and how private enterprise really show leadership in that, especially businesses that are in the region already. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I agree with Connie, and, and, I, and I think when we, when we um, <coughs> kind of delivered this um, strategic vision for Sydney Science Park, we, we, we chose uh, three areas that... Sydney has a comparative advantage in, and, and most science parks will, you know, whether it's defence or you know, technology, they normally are leveraging off areas that are already happening in their area. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the, the areas we saw, and, the, and I think it's coming out more and more, is, you know, health. You know, we've got a first-class health system in Australia. There's a massive amount of investment going on in, in all the hospitals, which mm -hmm. is being, you know, when you look at all the investment going on, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, Food and agribusiness. You know, Western Sydney's always been the food bowl of Sydney, mm. and some of the biggest food companies in Australia have grown out of Western Sydney and are still based there. Um, and you know, energy and alternative energies. And every, Australia's always been quite a smart um, leader in, in, in um, whether it's um, you know petroleum extraction or whether it's been solar panels or whatever it is. Uh, it, it, it's always had a lot of good ideas and um, innovation in those areas. Um, it hasn't been probably a lot of commercialisation of those ideas. Mm -hmm. And I guess probably one thing I didn't um, point out is, you know, a big thing that we're trying to do is take us from just research and coming up with ideas to commercialising those ideas. Because Australia's mm -hmm. in the top five as an ideas nation, mm -hmm. but it's in the bottom kind of bottom of the pile mm -hmm. for commercialisation of ideas. And if we can pull up the commercialisation mm -hmm. of the ideas to be in the top five or ten, we'll create a massive amount of jobs and, and, and wealth. So I, I think we need to leverage off, you know, the investments in the hospitals. There can be a lot of research and interaction <coughs> and, and, mm. and uh, collabor collaboration between the hospitals mm. and researchers and industry, uh, you know, and, and in the food businesses that are located in the area. More interns, more interaction, more investment in research. Mm. Um, so I think we just need to, rather than reinvent the wheel, um, focus on the strengths we've got and try to leverage off those to build this this commercialisation off, off that base we've already got. Great. Are there any questions from the audience? Because I can keep asking questions all the time. Hi, how are you? Um, Just get a microphone to you. You need to hold it. Okay. Why don't I hold it? Uh, 
No? Won't work. Um, my name is Joyce DiMarcio. I'm from the Exhibition and Event Association of Australia. It's been a fabulous morning and this is a really interesting um, conversation that we're having with you all who are great investors in the region. Um, I heard the word tourism mentioned earlier and um, we like to talk about it in terms of the visitor economy because when people are gathering for events like this, we're not really doing tourism, we're doing business here today. When you go home tonight, when we all go home tonight, we're not going to go and tell people, I, I was a tourist today um, at this gathering that I went to. We actually feed the visitor economy and the visitor economy um, is driven by a whole range of visitor types. Mm -hmm. So in the context of the enormous opportunity that there is here in Western Sydney, I'm just wondering what kind of visitor economy are we trying to grow here? And if we are really trying to stimulate the visitor economy, how is that process being informed so that we get the right investment in purpose-built infrastructure for the full range of the visitor economy, not simply retrofitting establishments to try to cater to business events like this one? OK, thank you. Well, on the visitor economy, who would like to lead off with that? Um, I think that's an excellent question and um, I was listening to my um, <coughs> panellists uh, and there's a couple of points to pick up on is that, uh, you know, on, on diversity and, and amenity the, the was, was the words that they used and um, whatever industry, whether, you know, health's come up a few times and that is a great industry and it's a fantastic complex um, in, in the northern part of Parramatta. But whatever you build, you've got to build stuff around it, which I think is that's what your point is, is there's other... If you, could, you could build a great big... Actually, I used the example of ANZ a while ago, and it's a great development. Um, but it's a half an hour beforehand and half an hour afterwards a ghost town because there's nothing around it. So to stimulate the visitor economy, I think, is... And I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I, I, the, the, the private sector picks up a lot of it. Um, you know, niche things... Uh, uh, niche businesses are the ones that I think need some attention. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I just run a little club and we just do it ourselves. But the, with regards to how government could do it, I think, I think it, it could use some attention in that building a hospital... If you build a hospital or you build a school or you build some offices, you need social infrastructure around it. You need a place to have a drink. You need a place to call your place. Um, that's what makes a neighbourhood. And that's really what I think John was getting at when he talked about his development, which is... You know we're we're a, a, a drop in the bucket compared to that, but um, you, you need you need those. And we talked about Surrey Hills and why why the inner city works better. They've been building their neighbourhood for a hundred years. They've filled all the little niches. We're still filling ours. Um, I don't. I, I I think there should be some more attention on it. I think that the the private sector is always going to fill that gap, though. Just to add on to that as well, I think one of the key things is as, as some of this happens, I think it builds confidence in the region. So if I think about, um, you know, Vivid expanding to have um, installations <coughs> here in Western Sydney, just the confidence that that gives the region and then that actually attracts more private enterprise. And, and, um, and arts is really important in that as well. So we talk a lot and absolutely we need to have somewhere where we have a drink, we need somewhere where people could go with their families and still feel like they're adults, having two young kids, um, that's really important to me at the moment. Um, uh, and, um, but I think, you know, the, also having the diversity of the arts and, you know, we've got the museum and the, you know, the powerhouse and, and a few other things. And that just builds confidence and the community has that confidence, which as people come into the, you know, when visitors come in, um, they feel that confidence that the community has. And then that just allows for more private investment. So I think being able to just tweak some of those, you know, add to some of the things that we're already seeing happen and actually have that happen more broadly across Western Sydney and not as focused in at Parramatta, which will happen as, as it matures. And building that confidence is really important. But I do agree with Bevan that it is about private enterprise at this point, with some government. I, I agree. Uh, the government's role to me is, uh, you know, to bring things like the powerhouse, to build the stadium, to build the transport links. Mm -hmm. it, Confidence is the most important thing in, in, in the property industry, that's for sure. And, uh, I, you know, we're, that with those key pieces of infrastructure, the hospitals themselves are massive uh, investments and massive attractors. 
But the, 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 the investment that comes off the back of that, I think sometimes in the cost-benefit ratios of some of this public infrastructure, a lot of these benefits don't get taken into account. You know, people look at it and say, oh, it's only returning 98 cents on the dollar, we shouldn't build it. But it's all the other things, the confidence for that whole region that it creates that is not being taken into account. And I really think, you know, if, if all you did is run a you know, calculation through a computer and if it doesn't get to 100, you don't build it, we don't need government, we don't need leadership. The leadership takes the people who are going to build those things that they know might not make total financial sense today, but in 20 or 30 years' time, nobody's going to be going looking back and saying, oh, geez, that only got 98%, we should, should, you know, shouldn't have got built. I mean, the Opera House blew the budget, the Sydney Harbour Bridge blew the budget, every big piece of infrastructure worth its salt, generally, is, most of them have blown the budgets. And I, and I think the, you need to have courage, whatever side of government you're on, to do some bipartisan things like this is going to be good for the area, we just do, we just need to do it, and uh, and I, and, I, and I think the investment that will come off the back of that, like the airport, uh, you know, in Western Sydney, um, you know, they could have put more slots at Sydney Airport, or they could have done this and that and not built that, but that is going to pay dividends for Western Sydney for the next 30, 40 years and transform Sydney like it wouldn't have got transformed if it didn't happen, and I, I think they're the important things we need government to do. I, I don't think they need to be building the actual tourist facilities. I think they need to be building the things that, the platforms for those tourist facilities to be able to, you know, ride the back off. And well, I think South South. Sydney, which has been a major investment in the CDD, is too small already. It's, um, it's already too <laughs> small. Um, Sydney Olympic Park has some tremendous infrastructure. We heard this morning Christopher's call for investment in that. Uh, it is a real area of need. And as you all talk about the investment that you're bringing, and the opportunities that you're creating for industry to flourish out here, for people to be educated out here. People, businesses will want to come together to do business through trade shows, through consumer shows, mm -hmm. through knowledge sharing. Well, we need to think now about what are the re infrastructure requirements there to fuel that demand, because they're not going to fit into ICC Sydney. That's already a done deal. Yeah, it's not set up There's only so much that can go into Sydney Olympic Park because of the nature of the funding model there. What else are we going to do to leverage the opportunity for business to do business through the business events sector? And that's another tier of the, the visitor economy that sometimes gets left behind, even mm. though it's the highest yielding sector of the visitor economy. Right. Thank, you. Good point. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Got one last uh, question opportunity for anyone in the audience. Okay, Mark, gentlemen there in the second. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mark Hewitt from Education. Um, I just want to talk about waste management and recycling. Um, we're building all this infrastructure, higher densities. Um, councils are screaming out for different options, innovation in this space. Um, throwing in bigger holes or shipping it to China are not options. Um, as was mentioned, we've got some brilliant people here. We've got some brilliant universities. We'd like to see a lot more innovation and thought put into what we can do about it in Western Sydney here and deal with our own waste efficiently and develop a, a new industry from that. Okay. So you, can I try and... So you're asking the question, what could we be doing to, to I guess, uh, be more innovative and creative in creating an industry around, uh, I guess, waste management? Is that the question? Okay. I guess maybe I might throw it to John because I guess yeah. you're doing some pretty clever and innovative things at, at the science park around yeah. sustainability, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, as a general comment, I agree. I agree. Um, you know, waste is a resource. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and waste has other factors on uh, urban areas that don't, it's not just to do with the rubbish. I mean, how many times I've sat in a, a council meeting where a whole development gets designed by the guy who drives a garbage truck? Um, and people don't believe that, but it's true, you know, and, and, and these types of decisions are being made that make our urban areas quite inefficient. So I, I think that is an area worth certainly looking at, and I won't go into all the, the detail, but I, but I, I think, you know, with, um, uh, you know, biomass and things like that, and there's, uh, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of opportunities around waste that haven't been um, uh, looked at, and I think some of that, and I, I see... John in the audience here, uh, uh, Mayor of Penrith City Council, so I won't have a go at councils, but I, I think whether it's in waste or whether it's in wastewater or whether it's in, I think some of the 
not a problem, but I guess it's just a fact is that some of these things have become business models for the utilities, you know, or for councils, you know, they, they make money out of these things. Um, and so there's not an appetite to change it too much or, you know, it's a big change to go from what's how it's happening now to, to a different system. So um, I, I, I got to compliment Penrith City Council because they are up for looking at new ideas and innovation. And I'm not just saying that because John Zero say that to anyone I speak to. And it, it's, it's, there needs to be innovation in that space. We, we've signed an agreement with the CSIRO uh, to create an urban living lab, a, a zone where we can trial different ideas and, ru and garbage and rubbish and recycling is, is one of those areas. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, um, it's a challenge because sometimes uh, it's more expensive to do these things in the short term so it's, it just becomes too hard politically to support it. Um, but I think uh, it, I, we certainly believe there's, uh, op there's opportunities, not just problems with garbage and we certainly want to explore the opportunities. I think though there's some, the council's a challenge because they can't, each council has their challenge but they can't solve it alone and they have to, you know, they have to band together or they have to rely, have to, you know, get help from the state government. But also we're seeing some really, I mean, see, uh, the water company, uh, our water companies across Australia are doing some amazing things with waste to energy and so again it'll be government, private enterprise and, you know, and some really great thinking from hopefully some very young and um, smart people of how we deal with this challenge and which won't get easier. Yeah. When you, you're talking about waste, we actually closed our loop with organics. So we have food waste that's recycled that comes back as compost onto our playing field. So we closed the loop there. Took a lot of pain uh, initially when we recycled food waste and green waste. Um, Cedar, or it is Suez now, built a new plant to do that. Um, but it's worked really well, so our fields have never looked better because we actually recycle food waste. Okay. Well, I didn't think we'd finish this conversation on food waste, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I guess it, it, it does reflect, though, it does reflect, though, the innovation that's required and the jobs that will be of the future. At our Shaping Future City Steering Committee yesterday, there was a, a couple of comments made. One of them was around the airport and, in fact, that the operating systems for the new airport in fact currently don't actually probably exist. They will be quite new technology that will actually, if you like, manage and run that, that airport. And so if you follow the natural extension of that, um, the job to actually manage that probably doesn't exist and the skills and the talents for that need to be developed. So I think that's the overarching message is that the, there needs to be agility through our education system to allow us to, to be able to, uh, I guess, have those jobs of the future because one thing's for certain, we will have the population, we have the skills, we have the abilities <laughs> and it's just about channelling that and creating those opportunities to soak up the demand and the supply that we have here. So thanks to our panellists, if you'd please show that with your appreciation to uh, Bevan, Connie and John. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you do want to scoot off to the other room downstairs, you are more than welcome. Uh, keep it to a dull roar and we'll get the other panellists up here. John, I'm going to have to ask you to ch ch take your chat somewhere else because we are really pushed for time and I'm about to uh, introduce some people who want to sit in your chair that you've very thoughtfully warmed up for them. We've, uh, our first one was making sense of the environment. This one is planning for a cooler and greener Western Sydney. And our, our panellists and our moderator have made their way yeah. to the front yep. already. Sarah Clift is the coordinator of the Parramatta River Catchment uh, Group, an alliance which aims to have the river swimmable again by 2025. That is a worthy goal indeed. Fiona Morrison is the Commissioner of the Office of Open Space and Parklands in the Department of Planning and Environment. And Paul Plowman is the General Manager of Livable Solutions at Sydney Water. And uh, our moderator is Adjunct Professor Rod Simpson, who is the Environment Commissioner at the Greater Sydney Commission. So please make them welcome. And Rod, all yours. Thanks. Uh, I hadn't prepared this link, but it's interesting that we've got the economy followed by the environment and what's the linkage. And I think what's actually just, we ended up on waste. 
which is probably unexpected. And I think that that's actually what's coming out of this, um, I think, even today, the idea of harnessing what's going on and not necessarily value capture, which is a sort of immediate thing that people think of when we talk about harnessing, but I think we're talking about harnessing the innovation that we can actually need to develop as we build and develop these new places. And I think that's what's just come out of the last discussion. So really, the people we've got right here right now, um, I've got a few questions. I'm going to throw them out of order because we're quite short on time. I sure. do apologise. I know that you've got the thing fully prepared, but Sarah. Um, but I think the other thing is that this, this idea of place. And also, one of the themes that came out of this morning's discussion was the perception of Western Sydney. So Sarah's been running a fantastic program on the Parramatta River Master Plan. And in that plan, I wasn't aware that you can actually swim in Parramatta River safely for 80% of the time, right? Now, Beach Watch sets a very high bar of 95%, and Sarah has taken on the job of actually getting to that 95%. I reckon she's setting the bar a bit too high. <laughs> I reckon that's a bit too difficult, because I think 80% of the time is absolutely fantastic in an urban waterway. So my question is, it's about perception, what do you think about changing the perception of the Parramatta River and the wonderful waterways we have in Western Sydney? And what, how do we communicate that in terms of the monitoring and so forth and the way we might manage it um, and the governance that goes with that? Your thoughts? I think I'll leave it as an open question like that, where you've got to and what you think about the future of the, the waterways. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting actually when we first launched the uh, vision to make Parramatta River swimmable again and we got a whole bunch of different responses like, wow, that's awesome, to as if that's not going to happen. Um, and it was all of, all of the uh, spectrum in between. Um, we, as part of our master plan, we actually went out to the community and, and surveyed over 1,100 people across uh, our 11 local government areas uh, to actually find out what do they actually genuinely think. Um, and so firstly, um, 78% of people said there was in, they had an interest in swimming in a designated area along the Parramatta River. Um, more than two thirds of those people actually wanted to be the people swimming as opposed to just visiting those locations like, like people going to the beaches. And more than half of those people said they'd actually prefer to swim in the Parramatta River than travel to the beaches if it was half the distance from home. And so it kind of put into context for us that whole thing about Western Sydney and that people actually really have a demand for a local place, a local natural place to swim. Um, so is, this, is the bar set too high? Um, international rivers are embarking on similar missions of trying to make their, their local urban waterways safe uh, places for people to recreate and enjoy and, uh, and create them as living rivers that are uh, ecologically uh, healthy as well as uh, safe places for people to um, to boat and swim. Um, we, I would say, in in Sydney and in the Parramatta River, we're actually quite blessed in that most international rivers it is a dream. It's a long term, long distance dream, and they're creating swimming places that are more constructed and and kind of offline. Whereas we actually already have four swimming sites in the Parramatta River, so Chiswick Baths, um, Lake Parramatta. Uh, Dawn Fraser Bars and Cavarita are all swimming sites that already currently be reach the beach watch standards um, based on water quality monitoring, and you can actually swim there already. And um, and so and and Lake Parramatta is an amazing example where it got open for the first time in 72 years four years ago. Um, the first year we had I think 11,000 visitors, and we've just had stats through in the last. Uh, season and there's over 40,000 visitors in the last season and so you can see that the popularity of that site is just escalating and I guess just that gives an example of if you if you create those opportunities people will come and uh, and there's there's different perceptions but the important thing is to actually go and ask the community um, so yeah so I'd say that we're not setting the bar too high I'd also say that you know we've, we've been hearing this morning about the central river city that word river is in Central River City. And, uh, and if we don't have an amazing river that goes through the Central River City, then what are we aspiring to, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we know, as, as Rod said, we know that the river has been improving over the last 20 years. Uh, we know that around about 80% of the time, most areas on the Parramatta River are actually swimmable. Um, the issues are around 
when there's wet weather, we have things like sewer overflows and also um, issues relating to stormwater. And, uh, and so what we're trying to do in our master plan is trying to integrate those two and look at the most efficient ways of uh, improving things. So we have done a whole heap of robust modelling um, and thanks Sydney Water for supporting that. Um, and as part of that modelling, we've actually found that um, A, um, we know that with interventions, we can keep the trajectory going forwards and we can uh, open up new swimming sites along the river. Um, but under a business as usual, so a current business as usual trajectory with the projected growth and development along the river, um, that current trajectory of improvement could um, arrest and, and possibly start to decline. And so there are, so basically the message is it's totally achievable, but we have to do something slightly different to the business as usual. I was going to ask um, Fiona to jump in. We're talking about the blue and green grid. They're, they're simple terminology, but I think everyone gets it. Um, so, look, I will go to you, to Fiona. Uh, the, the fantastic announcements and commitments now to increasing canopy, five million trees. Um, I've been which, planting this morning. What's that? No, I'm <laughs> Long way to go. I mean, I mean it's, it, it is fantastic that the government sort of come out and said that. I guess, and I'll combine a question I was going to actually ask later, how, if we're all, I think in this room particularly, accepting that great places have blue and green grid and canopy and greenery and so forth, um, and we start now to talk about it as being green infrastructure and essential infrastructure, so a tough question, <laughs> which is how do we get the commitment to the ongoing management and maintenance of, of uh, those trees, the rollout program beyond the first $38 million for the first planning, which is a lot but how we keep that going out to 2030. Then, how do we actually get green infrastructure into the state infrastructure strategy? <laughs> well, look, green infrastructure is so essential. Every single one of us, every day, has an interaction with green infrastructure. It's our, it's our street, it's our front garden, it's our backyard, it's, it's the park, it's a park we look at from a 31st story of a, an office building or, it, it, is, it is the fabric upon which we live our lives in. And calling it green infrastructure is very specifically done. Um, it is just as important as the grey and the blue. Uh, it is long term and it is living. Uh, majority of green infrastructure gets better over time. You plant a garden today and in five years time it's going to be, it's going to be much, much greater and better than it is the day that you plant it. The tree you plant as a small sapling in 20 years' time becomes something so greater. So green infrastructure is so unique because it gets better and better with time. And that ties into that, that long-term view of management. Now the, the 5 million tree program is really exciting and it's about urban canopy and it's about shade and heat island. Uh, for us, the, the, the KPI, it, it isn't five million, that's, that's a target that we're aiming for, but our, our KPI is a 40% canopy cover. You don't get that by planting five million tube stock trees. You get that over time. So this is a program that lasts for 12 or 13 years, depending how you count you get to 2030. Um, and it is about canopy extent. So that, imp that requires long-term commitment to maintenance rather than just plant the tree in the ground and walk away. So we're partnering with, with councils, uh, we're doing pilot projects so that we can start to understand, especially in Western Sydney where the soils are different and they are challenging for, for planting, how we get the science right, how do we make it as easy as possible to set the tree up for the right start in their life so that we get that canopy. So there's a lot of investment, a lot of research that's going into the program, as well as the, the joy that we will have of kids and families out there planting. It's backyards, it's front yards, it's the street, it's the park, it's uh, on Sydney Waterland, thank you very much, and <laughs> that commitment. But it's everywhere, we need everyone to get involved with this, and it's, mm. it's really exciting that the, the government has now recognised the importance of green infrastructure with the announcements that we have for strategic open space, inclusive playgrounds, and for five million trees and urban canopy. Mm. I think what you, certainly from my perspective in the Greater Sydney Commission, what's been happening over the last couple of years as we've prepared the plans, is this refocusing on place. And as we 
all are interested in creating these great places, it means the normal silos in the various agencies and bureaucracies and so on are actually starting to break down because we have to break down those silos to have a discussion about what happens in place. Yeah. So in mm. terms of the trees, of course, they're going to need water. Yeah. And um, this is your CEO's um, phrase, not mine, but um, Sydney Water wants to go in f from being the uh, city's master plumber to being involved with being the master planner. Mm -hmm. um, but with that, it actually changes the entire conception of water services. So, Paul, could you talk about how you know, Sydney Water is starting to actually recast what it does and how it sees itself as being mm -hmm. part of that place planning and place making activity? Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine green infrastructure without blue infrastructure Absolutely. somewhere. The water's got to come from somewhere. Um, I, the, the whole idea of um, place-based planning is an amazing opportunity and um, I might raise the issue of waste again um, just slightly, um, again a little bit later, but um, w what it does is provides the opportunity for different agencies and service providers coming together and thinking about it as a collective um, opportunity that we're trying to solve and it means that you reframe we're not operating in silos um, as Rod just said it's kind of that idea of um, uh, you know the collective is better than the sum of the parts and if we all focus and come to those conversations with a generosity of spirit and what we can provide um, it, it gets a better community outcome for those people that are going to be living in the in in those places in the future. So it's a huge opportunity, but it, it does provide lots of opportunities. And if we can have a conversation about water infrastructure at the same time, we're having a conversation about green infrastructure. If we're having the conversation about transport, and if we're having the conversation about the types of land uses we want there, it brings up a whole bunch of more opportunities for us. If we're having a conversation about waste. And we talk about, well, what are, if we're talking about um, um, how waste will move through a new community. And um, we talked for, about Parramatta just before, um, I was at Penrith Council around how, what they've done with food waste. If we co-locate the right industries, the, the, the potential food industries that we'll have in Western Sydney close to our wastewater treatment plants, our wastewater treatment plants can provide the water that is needed for a green um, infrastructure grid. It can also provide the opportunity to produce power out of that waste. Um, if we think about this in a collaborative sense, there's huge amounts of opportunities that we've never had in the city if we just keep going down our silos. Um, you can tell this conversation goes a bit from place, which sounds exciting, mm -hmm. but also ends up always with management <laughs> <laughs> and ongoing uh, management. Uh, which I found now a, a deeply fascinating subject because the the management then goes to um, perhaps Paul, if you could continue talking about mm. how as you as Sydney Water's go, going from being a services provider in a very narrow sen sense, you know, providing mm. either potable water or um, you know dealing with wastewater, and now you're starting to think about how you have water reuse. But also, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between? your semi-public, well, you are a public entity, mm. but the opportunities for innovation that come up in relationship to other water technologies through the, the Wicker Act, if everyone knows what I'm talking about, which is the Water Infrastructure um, Competition Act, I think is yep, that. Yeah, that's right. Um, which is the sort of thing that John Vassalo just previously was talking about, which makes innovation possible, uh, mm. that, but still fits into a bigger system. Can you talk about that a bit and about Sydney Water's role? Yeah, I, I think... Um this comes back to this whole idea of being a master planner and, um, and what emerges um, out of looking at the whole system or the whole um, area of Western Sydney is that the more fragmentation we have, a, a developer over here deciding that this is how they want to service water or a developer over here, um, we're involved in all of those conversations, but essentially that ends up being a fragmented, um, isolated island of infrastructure. Um, if we think about it as a whole system, um, um, it is much more efficient. And if we keep going down a fragmented framework, you know, at the end of the day, it's customers that end up paying um, that premium for that. So I guess um, what we talk about when we talk about master planner is having joined up thinking across the whole system. And then once you've got a plan in place and joined up thinking, there is a huge amount of opportunity for exactly what Rod's just said, the private sector to invent innovate. Um, but those plans should clearly indicate um, requirements or specifications for all of those outcomes that we just talked about when we talk about place. 
that that infrastructure is in the right spot, it's going to be in the right spot, produce the right things. And once that's decided, huge amounts of opportunity. And at the end of the day, if infrastructure is built in the right spot, competition delivers benefits for customers in the long run. So that's that's how we see it. And we, we the way we look at, um, you know, my responsibility is sort of planning for um, for for all of the growth and and all of our infrastructure. And um, our frame of reference is um, it's Sydney's water future, not uh, Sydney Water's future. Um, and that's how we position um, the way we go about planning. And, and, and that's what we bring to the table when we talk about place-based uh, um, planning. And just to follow on the management, the place-based planning um, in the Parramatta River Master Plan work, I mean, what emerged there was that, as you've already heard Sarah mention, the, the sewer overflows combined with the uh, dispersed sources of pollution from stormwater and so forth, um, it hasn't been easy in the past to actually manage overall catchments and so forth. Um, can you talk briefly about your, you know, the investigation of a light touch governance that you've actually started to look at, which is really about people talking to each other and then managing things in a, in a much more non-regulatory way. Can you talk about that last bit of work that you've done? Um, yeah, so I guess just to context that, so um, for those of you who don't know, the um, Parameter River Catchment Group is um, an alliance of 11 councils that sit within the Parramatta River catchment. Um, so we're ranging from Hunters Hill in the west out to Blacktown, up to the Hills Shire and down to Bankstown. Um, and we also have the Department of Planning and the Environment, Sydney Water and the EPA as financial members on the group. And so it really is very much a collaborative process um, and we also have community representatives. Um, so I guess just thinking about that place base, we, we saw, you know, there's master plans um, for, for places all going up all around the, the river, the river foreshores. Um, you know, you've got major precinct development, master plans and, and other um, areas. And so we decided, well, the river itself needs its own master plan. The river itself is a place that people are enjoying and want to go. And so that's kind of connecting to that whole kind of place-based approach. Um, so that alliance has worked really well in terms of, um, I guess, coordinating and working together. As um, uh, Rod alluded, I guess the governance of waterways is quite complex and quite confusing and even the people that work in it often get confused as to whose responsibility and whose ownership different parts of the asset and infrastructure network um, are. And, uh, and so councils mostly have responsibilities over stormwater. Sydney Water has responsibilities over the sewer network, but also little bits of stormwater. Um, and ultimately, we say every person in Sydney has a role to play in terms of making the river swimmable again because of the kind of pollution that goes into the stormwater network, whether that's dog poo, whether that's um, erosion coming from uh, development sites, uh, whether that's chemicals coming off um, industrial sites and things like that. So ultimately, it's a collaboration that everyone has to be involved in. So we kind of turned the master planning a process upside down and we launched a mission without a plan. And, uh, and the first step that we did was we actually just went to the community and said, hey, here's 22 historic swimming sites along the river that once were swimmable and, uh, and they're no longer swimmable. Where would you like to swim in the future? And so we just got the community to show their interest and show their support and commitment to the cause by, uh, by voting for where they wanted to swim. Mm -hmm. um, and then we went into, um, we had then the support, I guess, um, to say, yep, let's go for this. And, uh, and then we developed a really, I guess, scientific backing. And, uh, and that's been really important as master plan is the scientific mm -hmm. basis and, and establishing a baseline understanding of where we're at and also the modelling. and. Mm -hmm. The next step is really that we need to start getting um, the governance right in terms of how we monitor the river yeah. and also and so that we can and not only monitor the health of the river but also monitor the works that we're doing and, and report and kind of, I guess, be accountable in terms of all the agencies that are working together to kind of report that, you know, the infrastructure that's getting put in is, is maintained with design intent and is actually achieving the outcomes that we're wanting to mm. achieve. I think we've... Have we got time for one question? One. One question. <laughs> um, but look, you probably... <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I might throw that to you, Fiona, um, if that's all right. Uh, does anyone have a question for Fiona? No. <laughs> in particular? Well, just because I thought you might have a second, second response in some form. 
Uh, hi, I'm Ryan Senior from ACOM. Uh, I just want to understand what it's going to take to get green infrastructure and to an extent uh, the things that enables it like water to be better valued and to be on the state asset register. Uh, we've done some work that values uh, the impact of green infrastructure on property prices and other things. Um, how are we going to get to that point where we're valuing it properly? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's work that's underway. Uh, there's the Greener Places document that's been prepared by the government architect that is really clear in its definition and the, the communication of value and importance of green infrastructure. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work with um, different agencies to, to get the language right and to um, work with, with Treasury so that they start to understand that you know, value about green infrastructure and the work that we're doing is, is not just um, money in a spreadsheet. There's so many health values, mental health, uh, social, cultural values. Um, and it's those softer measures that do take some, some work in getting people to understand. So we're doing a lot of work on that at the moment so that we can be really clear to say that green infrastructure is essential. Um, it is as essential as the blue and the grey. Uh, it is ongoing, it's ongoing work, but it's certainly been uh, championed by the work of the Greater Sydney Commission um, in their district plans and also by the Government Architects Office. The, the work is, is happening and we're going to forge forth and continue with that. And it's a place for the private sector as well. You know, you have immense opportunity to uh, change the way clients think about this work. So there's inf influence and advocacy on government side, in local government and in the private sector. And I think as we bring our, our conversations together and break out of that siloed approach, I think that that green infrastructure will start to be truly valued um, for, for what it does offer and the benefits that it provides. Hmm. Look, we might wrap up there for lunch. Um, I would just point out one thing, which is it's actually worth reading the state infrastructure strategy. <laughs> It's also worth reading bits and pieces, not the whole lot of uh, the Metropolitan mm. Plan and so forth, or the, the Greater Sydney Regional Plan. And the reason I think it's worth reading those is because the conversation we're having here, which I think you can start to see, is a joined up conversation between water services and green infrastructure and then some of the regulatory approaches mm. of the past are breaking down. And I think we truly are at the cusp of a really very big shift in the way that we plan our cities. And that's the opportunity I think we really do have in Western Sydney to actually, if you like, reboot, refresh and harness that innovation. So I think hearing from Fiona and what she's up to, from Paul, and also Sarah, if you could thank them with me, um, that'd be great. Let's have some lunch.